What's up? All right, everyone having a good day? Good weekend? Football? Good? LSU? They kicked ass. Let's see who else. Who else played? Aggies? They did okay. Gators? What else we got? Uh, who lost? A couple, couple big upsets, too. West Virginia got upset. Who else? Yeah, there we go. Penn State actually won a game. This might be the last time I say that this season. Let's see. Uh, so, Justin. Justin, so you volunteered to go first today. What, what, what holiday is today? Uh, it's also there. <laughs> yes. Well, you're both right. And it's actually a very fitting day. Uh, today is, in fact, Constitution Day. Did anyone know that's a holiday? Did anyone know that's a holiday? In fact, this is actually a kind of a curious holiday. Any school that receives any kind of federal money is actually required by law to put in a program for Constitution Day about the Constitution. I'm pretty sure South Texas is not compliant to that law. But, uh, so I'm going to do it here. And you got, you got this covered. But you should know that I'm not doing this because of a mandate. I'm doing so I want to. So it's a very big difference. Question. Okay. So today is Constitution Day. And this is the, let's see, who can do math? How many years since the Constitution was signed? Okay, what year was it signed? Oh, God. What did you say, songs? Declaration. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What year? What happened in 1789? What happened in 1789? The article of consideration? Oh my god. All right. Jesus. All right. Mini mini civics lesson if you, if you learn nothing this year. <laughs> Declaration of Independence. July 4th, 1776. Articles of Confederation, 1783-ish, because they took a couple different years to be ratified. The Constitution was signed in Philadelphia, 1787. The Constitution was ratified by the 11th state in 1789. Actually, I think it's New York and Vermont didn't ratify until significantly later, but the Constitution said when 11 states ratify, it's a union, even though the Articles of Confederation required unanimity. Okay? What, what year were the Bill of Rights ratified? The first 10 amendments. Oh, God, you're killing me. <laughs> Anyone, please, Bueller. 1791, the first 10 amendments were ratified. Is that what you said? Yeah. But you didn't say it to me. <laughs> no, no, no you, you were afraid. Okay. How many amendments are there to the Constitution? 26, 26. What was the most recent amendment ratified? What, approximately what year was it ratified? Good. Like 93, yeah. And what was it? <laughs> Affecting pay of Congress. It effectively said Congress can't raise their own pay. And what's fascinating about the 26th Amendment is that it was actually started to be petitioned back in the 1790s. And it didn't get enough signatures until like 1992. It was actually ratified fairly recently. Okay. All right. Does anyone want to go through the Bill of Rights? I'll do it if you want. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. First Amendment. What's in it? For freedom. Speech, religion, assembly, and press. Yes, petition grievances. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's called the petition clause. All right, Second Amendment. You guys here in Texas know this one. Yes, I'm one of my one of my personal favorites. All right, third, Third Amendment. What's the Third Amendment? Ooh. Oh. Good, good, good. And for once, don't Google it. I want you to actually like, know this one. All right. Fourth Amendment, there's a couple things in it. What's the key one? Searches and seizures. Good. All right. Fifth Amendment, there's a lot of stuff, but I'll take as much as you got. Good. Everyone take the fifth. What else? Good. Takings clause. What else? Due process. What's due process? <laughs> no, you're, you're right on. Um, but you have. 
You cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This is effectively a procedural clause. You can't be, you can't stuff taken away from you without proper process, and process is law, and law is courts, and that's what you guys do. You guys ensure due process is followed along too. All right, uh, private property, double jeopardy, uh, grand jury indictments. You have the right to federal grand jury indictment, but do, in, is that right applying to the states? No. It's one of the one of the two or three rights that's never been incorporated in states. So some states do not have grand jury indictments. That's something called then good information. Exactly. And that's effectively a statement signed by a prosecutor saying, um, you know, there's enough charge to go forward. All right. Sixth Amendment. This one's gonna be trickier. Good. Speedy trial. I heard it. What else? Good. Confrontation clause. What does that mean? Yeah, so if someone wants to testify against you, you have to confront them. All right, what else? This one, The last one you're not going to get. Compulsory process. This means if there's a witness who helps your case, the government has to go find that person. All right, Seventh Amendment. This one's somewhat obscure, but you hope we cited in maybe Civ Pro. Good. Now, the tricky part. For how much money? $20. And that's not, not indexed for inflation. But that's different than 1331 for diversity jurisdiction, which is $75,000. That's totally separate. This is a constitutional minimum for jury trials. Okay, Eighth Amendment. You can think of this class as a form of infliction of it. <laughs> exactly. All right, Ninth Amendment. What? No, you said it. I heard, I heard it. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Ninth Amendment says... The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. What that means? Huge controversy. We don't actually know what it means. But it effectively says that just because a right is not listed in the Constitution doesn't mean we don't have it. Unenumerated rights. Okay? Tenth Amendment. Texas, you better know this one. Good. Very good. Yes. So all powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the state and to the people. People, you forget the second part. All right, now I'll stop at 11 because it's kind of big for common law. 11th Amendment. What? Yeah, we actually talk about sovereign immunity. What does that mean, sovereign immunity? Well, what does the 11th Amendment actually say? You can't sue the state in which you reside. But that's not actually what it means. The Supreme Court says you can't sue any state without their consent. Okay? That's the first 10. Uh, 12, as respecting uh, election of president and vice president, you might not know this, but at the time of the founding, the person who got the most votes was president, the person who got the second most votes was vice president. That was a, that was a mess. No one actually liked that. You didn't actually have a ticket. Uh, you guys know this one. What's the 13th Amendment? Come on, Texas. Yes, emancipation of slavery. Good. Well, yeah. <laughs> you are in Texas. All right, 14th Amendment. This is a biggie. Okay, I'm looking for three clauses. Equal protection, due process. What's the other one you always forget? Ooh. Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, there are three main clauses. Due process, equal protection, and privileges. Or, or, the privileges and immunities clauses in Article 4 of the Constitution, privileges or immunities in the 14th Amendment. So equal protection means we have to be treated equally. There's a case, years of Texas versus Fisher coming up this term, whether Texas can have their top 10% plan. You're probably familiar with that, affirmative action. Due process, you would very wise say that due process clause in the Fifth Amendment, that only applies to the feds. This is in the 14th Amendment, applies due process to the states. And the privileges or immunities clause means absolutely nothing because the Supreme Court said so, but it should be for some set of other rights outside the Constitution. All right, 15th Amendment. Ah, well, it makes sense. 13th, free the slaves. 14th. Gave rights to them. What's the 15th Amendment do? Vote. You cannot deny suffrage based on race. Okay? 16th Amendment, you will hate this very soon. Every April 20th. No, that's marijuana. April April 15th. <laughs> <laughs> no. April 15th. The income tax, yes. You probably do like April. I guess April 20th comes after April 15th for that reason, I suppose. <laughs> All right, 17th Amendment. You're close. Uh, originally, they were appointed by state legislatures. Keep, keep coming. Senators, direct election of senators. A lot of people want to repeal this. 18th Amendment, this one you absolutely hate. What did you say? Prohibition, yes. It banned the sale of alcohol. 
19th Amendment, the ladies probably like? Women's suffrage, good. 20th Amendment has to do with when the presidents take office. It eliminated this long, lame duck period. Okay. 21st Amendment, you guys have a kegger. Yes, repeals prohibition, good. 22nd Amendment was the FDR Amendment. You can't run more than twice. Uh, 23rd Amendment, that makes the District of Columbia have a representation uh, for electoral votes, but they're not actually a state. It's a quasi-weird thing. Uh, 24, anyone vote after the age of 18 here? Yeah, when you were 18? 24th Amendment allows uh, voting for uh, people uh, over the age of 18. The 25th Amendment has some stuff about the removal of the president if he becomes incapacitated. Like in every Jack Clancy novel, this always comes into play. 26th Amendment, I think I said the 27th, they're actually 27, sorry. 26th Amendment is 18-year-old voting, and 27th Amendment is the paying of senators can't be affected until they leave office. So that means they can't raise their own salary. Okay? You got all that? That won't be on the final, but as lawyers, you should know that, and it's Constitution Day. And today is the 225th anniversary of the Constitution. It is the 100 and let's see, 40th, 40th anniversary of the Battle of Antietam, which I guess you people in uh, uh, Texas will, will know a lot about, more than the Constitution, I guess. And it's also the 5,773rd anniversary of Moses getting the Ten Commandments at Sinai, which is the Jewish holiday. Today is a Jewish New Year. So uh, actually in the Hebrew calendar, the year is 5773. Uh, if I'm a little bit tired, I was actually at uh, Temple all morning, and I ran here just in time to get here, so hopefully this goes swimmingly. Okay. <laughs> I, was actually, I was actually on a plane from Pittsburgh at 5.40 a.m. this morning to get here. Long story. So I hope I'm awake by the end of my night class. I think I'm okay now. This, I get invigoration from the Constitution, so this actually worked quite well. <laughs> dead serious. I wasn't planning on that, but you guys, after the articles of, what's it, conspiration? <laughs> oh, the articles of consideration. <laughs> Well, between the two of you, it's pretty bad. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I was actually going to play this for you. Uh, David Kerr is a famous professor at Chicago, and he has this reading of the Constitution. It's fantastic. Just I linked to it. Just listen to the first 30 seconds. He has just this uh, excellent timbre. I came and approximated. Since I bored you already, I won't do it for you again. <laughs> Nana, you already got 15 minutes off your class. That's it. <laughs> That's all you get. Now you title insurance. This is Brandon. Oh, oh. Yeah, a uh, baby. Congratulations. Aww. And he showed a picture. It's very cute. Was it, what's the name? Annie. Annie. Okay. Say aw, Annie. Aw, Annie. Okay. All right. Let's get back to s enough of the frivolity. Um, all right. Let's let's move on to title insurance. Okay. So we've been talking about title insurance all year, um, and every time we say. Well, the person should have gotten title insurance, or the person should have gotten title insurance. Um, but we should know that just because you have title insurance doesn't mean you're covered. Not all policies are created equal. There are various exceptions in life. So the first thing I want to show you is a couple uh, sites from Texas. Um, Texas has standardized forms for title insurance. Um, so they're going to look pretty much the same if you ever have to buy a house or something. I linked to a couple of these pages online. This page just gives you kind of ownership of what the title policies are, what they protect, um, what the different languages are. Um, not this one. This one. This one's kind of interesting. The, the the fees for insurance premiums are actually kind of fixed by statute. And if you actually look at this table, it tells you how much the policy is allowed to be. So if the say the property value is ten thousand dollars, say a very small piece. The premium can't be more than $229. And it kind of goes on a sliding scale. And when you're over $100,000, which is where I suspect most houses in Texas are, more or less, they have these complicated formulas, which I won't go through. We barely counted when the Constitution was signed, so I'm not even expecting to do any simple arithmetic. But this is roughly how insurance policies are formulated. So this is fixed by statute in Texas. And the form, if you go to this page, um, where is it? Uh, here it is. This works. This is actually a sample owner's policy, and this is what it looks like. Um, and this should be more or less what you'll see in most states. Um, but always pay attention to the subject, the exclusions. This is usually where they get you. Uh, so what's covered? Defects in title, forgery, fraud. Um, the lien has been imposed on it. There's some sort of unpaid lien. 
an encroachment, encumbrance, uh, or other kind of lien. So it's actually somewhat limited what's covered. We have cases today of like, you know, is there toxic waste on the land or um, other, other any kind of deficiencies in the land? And in those cases, it's frequently often not covered. And we'll get to those cases in a couple minutes. But just know that um, title insurance really exists as a way to supplement the, the uh, public records office. The public records office won't always have the best records. I think we went over this last week. You said, if I go to a records office and I ask them to, to record something that's absolutely false, will they check it? And the answer is no. They'll record anything you give them that looks legitimate. So these title companies exist for the sole purpose of double checking and making sure that they're accurate. And most places you buy a title from, they're going to do their homework. Um, although they might not have the duty to do their homework, they might just have the duty to write a policy and we'll do that in one of the cases today. All right, so let's see. All right, well, let's get started. And Cassandra is not here today, of course, the one case here from New Jersey, of course. Um, I think it's actually intentional. So this is the Rogi versus Chelsea. And uh, let's start let's start in the back row. Matthew? Okay, I'll call you in a second, okay? <coughs> so in this case, the, the person who messed up was Rogue. He purchased a plot of land, but he didn't actually conduct his own survey initially. He relied on an older survey. And there were two surveys at issue here. Um, the first survey was this 1975 survey by, uh, let's see what's the name, by uh, Walker. And it said that there were eight, roughly 18 acres. I don't, don't worry about decimals. The person he bought it from, COSA, had another survey done. And the COSA survey said there were 12.486 acres. Just, just make it 12, make it easier, 13. So the buyer knew about this, he knew about this, this uh, survey. He didn't know about this survey. So he actually got about five acres less than he thought. And the contract, the deed, didn't specify the acreage. So, um, Matthew, what did, the, what did the deed say would happen if the land, there wasn't as much land as they thought there would be? Did they, did they work out an arrangement if the land turned out to be less than they thought it was? Mm -hmm. Well, wasn't there something to adjust the price if there wasn't enough land? Lily, you want to help him out? Uh, Abraham? All right. Uh, Crystal? Exactly. Right, so they kind of expected that maybe this deed isn't going to be as accurate as we think it is. So I think the, I think the language was the, the price is adjusted $16,000 uh, $16, per acre for deviation. So anything under 19, every additional acre below, they'd be compensated another $16,000. But the actual deed itself didn't mention the acreage. Okay, so they got a title insurance policy from Chelsea. And let's see, okay. Uh, Sarah, what 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 did the what did the title insurance policy cover? We I just showed you the Texas one here, and I think there were um, four things that were not covered. And it's actually pretty similar to what th this policy didn't cover. Um, I know it covered like uh, mm -hmm. the, I know it covered easements and um, encumbrances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So one, they always cover if the title's vested somewhere else. So if you don't have title, uh, if there's any defects, liens, or encumbrances, um, say if there's no uh, right of access, you can't get to the land. Uh, if the title's unmarketable, remember I said this is like the most important thing. If the title's not marketable, the thing isn't junk. They always cover unmarketable titles. But let's see. Um, Emily, did it cover? Did it cover boundary disputes? Why? Why would it not cover a boundary dispute? Um, was it because the it's a point of already held? Be liable for any judgment against one party regarding a boundary dispute. Right. 
So battery disputes can resolve very easily up front. How can we resolve? By, uh, by giving us a survey of the answer. Yeah, by not relying on some old survey, right? So the way this policy was structured was that any battery dispute that could have been ascertained in advance will not be grounds to uh, indemnify the policy. So if you could have figured out up front, if uh, Mr. Rogi could have figured out up front that he actually had 12 and not 18 acres, or 13, whatever it is, he could have done that up front. The policy won't cover it, or at least that's how, that's how the uh, insurance company construed it. So Mr. Rogi lived there for a couple years, and then he had the genius idea of subdividing. Then he hired a new subdivider. And uh, let's see, Grace, what, what did the subdivider find? Um, I think it was below the acreage to the second So it was actually closer to 12, uh, 13 than it was to 18. Yeah, oh yeah, like 12.4. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, did, um, did Rogue sue the guy he bought it from? He sued the person. Why didn't he sue the guy he bought it from? Because well, I know his argument, like the title company should have the responsibility to make sure that the acreage was proper. I mean, couldn't, couldn't he have just, I mean, if, if he's off by five acres, right, and it's $16,000 per acre, couldn't he have just sued the guy under the original contract? Yeah, who has deeper pockets, Mr. Kosey or, or insurance company? Yeah, so he went after the deeper pockets. For all we know, uh, Mr. What's, whatever his name was, uh, Kosa was judgment proof. Maybe he didn't have any money. Maybe he was bankrupt. You know, he just, maybe he was a crook because he just sold off a piece of land for five acres less than he said it was. So, anyway, so he goes after the insurance company. All right, and uh, so Ben, what, what, what's the argument that um, Rogi makes? Uh, he makes two. He brings the argument for breach of contract. Good. He also brings one for negligence. Okay, so let's start, let's just focus on the breach of contract. What would the breach of contract be? How did, how did the insurance company breach? They breached by not uh, meeting their contractual obligation to make sure the title was as it was represented to be. Good. Right. So they, they insured it. Um, you know, they put the, they put they the policy up there. Yeah. See, now what's interesting, though, is in the vaults, in the records of the insurance company, they had the 1975 survey, right? It was, in the, it was in their property. So you're all lawyers, right? And say, you know, you have a client, and then there's some files in your records, which might be, in, in, which, assuming there's no privilege, put, put aside attorney client privilege, if you have some document in your possession that, that might be to the benefit of your client, do you have a duty to disclose it? Big time, yeah. Breach of fiduciary trust, assuming there's no privilege, you have a duty to disclose it to your client. So here, the insurance company not only weaseled out of their policy, they knew in advance that this policy wasn't good. So did the court, the Supreme Court of New Jersey agree that there was a breach, Ben? Uh, I don't, yep, no, 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 they found, they let them go back. Well, they, they went back on the negligence. That's right, they went back to calculate negligence. Let's just focus on the breach now, was there, was there a breach? I don't think so. No, let's see, uh, Medea, why was there no breach of contract? Let's see. Uh, I will not call on the person who said the baby who stayed up at night. Um, uh, Catherine. Mm -hmm. if, if the plaintiff had obtained a survey beforehand, would they have found the right number of acres? Didn't that language that, that we just read a second ago say something that could be discoverable by a survey? So whose fault is this? Yeah, yeah, he didn't do this. Also, one other point to stress. <laughs> is that the title company guarantees title, not acreage. Yes. Especially when the deed itself doesn't list the acreage. So be very careful what you're actually insuring. The title only covered, I'm sorry, the insurance policy only covered the title, not the acreage. Had they wanted, let's see, um, and had they wanted it to cover the acreage, what would they have had to get? Remember, remember abstract of title? Does that phrase ring a bell? Abstract of title? That, that's like, the, that's, that's like a, a title insurance on steroids. It covers everything. That's where you actually pay them to check the acres. You pay them to check all the liens, the easements, and everything. 
So had they gotten an abstract of title, then they could have actually been uh, covered for the acreage. So that, that's the breach of contract, and that one's pretty easy. Um, but uh, so, Caitlin, yes. What, what about the, um, uh, the, uh, the negligence suit? How, how did the, the court's analysis of that was actually kind of a little topsy-turvy. Was the case that there was not a duty for them to have done the survey, mm -hmm. that it would have been in, so it's not, not negligence, they didn't have a duty to say. But, but the but's a tricky one. <laughs> um, that I'm not sure about. All right, who, who, who knows what the but is? But they, they assume. Yes, yes. So remember the Good Samaritan's Law, and we say that in torts, like if you see someone drowning. You have no duty to help them. You can just watch them die. Like not like Seinfeld. You can just just watch them drown. But if you start to help them, and you're negligent in how you help them, you are liable. Remember that. So this is a very common theme. If you have no duty and you just sit back and you laugh, you're fine. But if you voluntarily do something and assume some sort of duty, then you're on the hook. In this case, they voluntarily assumed the duty to search, meaning they had these files in their records. They kind of did their own little search. They didn't tell the other guy about it. And I think, I think the Supreme Court said that the record was somewhat vague about exactly what duty they assumed. So, uh, Nikki Samani, what, what did, how did the court wind this case up? Well, I think they based on the and then we remanded for a finding relative, basically, that um, they were just basically saying that um, they would have sufficient evidence to possibly show mm -hmm. a prior negligence. Okay. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Chelsea had insured this property twice already. They had the documents in their records. They did their own little internal investigation. Does it make sense for anyone, for a title insurance company, to give a title without doing any research? Does that even make sense? That that'd be like you know you're going into like Geico or Allstate and you just give them your keys and say, all right here's a policy they do no no investigation about you, no business could possibly run like that, and in fact no business did run like that they did their own investigation they just didn't tell anyone about it, so they were knowingly selling policies on land they knew was wrong, they knowingly sold a policy for 18 acres probably for more money full well knowing that it was only 12 acres. Does anyone? Hey, anyone want to defend the, the proposition that insurance companies have no duty to do this kind of search? Does anyone think that makes any sense? Anyone? No one? I think it's kind of what they were doing in the case by saying you could extend the argument that they're only for the title, not the actual land in itself. Good. Um, Anthony. Good, and I'm glad you brought that up. Let's go back to this table, right? Because our, our fine republic fixes the rates that can be charged, when you, when you, when you set a, a price floor, a minimum price, what does that do to quality? So if you're a title insurance company and you know for this $10,000 piece of crap property you can only charge $229, think you can do a very good job? Now, can, can, can the premiums be above this? Yeah. So what ends up happening is people can afford to pay more, get significantly better title insurance. Whenever you set a floor of minimum price, the people at the very bottom of 24, they should get a crappier product. I think even here, like with um, like the, the car inspections, like you know, some places that charge a state minimum and some places that don't, places that charge state minimum have very long lines. Places that don't probably have much better service than they can, you know, it's very frequent when a state sets a minimum price. And when you set a minimum price, you have these kind of residual macro effects where everyone's kind of somewhat worse off. About half the states have a policy like New Jersey, and about half the states have a policy like you just play devil's advocate for, where you don't have this duty to disclose all defects for a title insurance company. Um, courts don't like holding title insurance companies liable because then they won't offer insurance. The easier you make it to sue an insurance company, the harder it is for them to grant policies. And if they're liable for less stuff, they just won't grant policies. Or they'll raise the prices of the policies, which maybe you prefer. Maybe you think it's better for uh, insurance companies to charge higher premiums 
and that way they can insure more stuff. But that might not be fun to someone who's buying a house, say, for you know, $100,000, and they can't afford a $900 policy. That'd be too much money for them. That's almost 1% of purchase price. Yes? Mm, that's, a, that's probably a question for another class. But, but generally, people who take out insurance policies get screwed. See Katrina? Um, yeah. It, it's not, insurance is usually stacked to the benefit of the insurance company. So I think the insurance company is your agent, but it gets weird if, say, you get into a car accident and your insurance company is representing you and they pay for your attorney. There's this weird split of a, um, a loyalty because the one sense they're your fiduciary, they're going to indemnify your claim. But in the other sense, they want to settle for as little as possible to keep down litigation costs. So there's always this tension if you ever do any personal injury work with an insurance company and you're an attorney is being paid by an insurance company, you have somewhat competing loyalties. So I'm not exactly sure how to characterize it to answer your question, but it's it's kind of weird when you're an insurance company because you wanna you wanna help your guy, you wanna help your 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 agent, but at the same time you don't want to pay too much money. Well, I mean, for this class, if one party if you're if you're an agent, then you have a duty to disclose. Yeah. Right, and New Jersey said that you have this duty to disclose. Let's just focus for a second on the difference between title insurance and general warranty deed. Um, we, the general warranty deed is kind of like the top of the pyramid, the best, the very best, best, best. Um, in some senses, title insurance is worse than a general warranty deed. Because the general warranty deed, um, the warranty covers all defects on and off the record. Whereas with title insurance, it only covers stuff on the record. So when you get some of the general warranty deed, you cover everything forever and ever and ever. Um, but title insurance has a couple positives. One, they'll cover your litigation costs. A general warranty won't do that. And also the warranty deed only covers claims by the paramount owner, someone who has a superior title, whereas the title insurance will cover other kinds of claims for like liens and stuff. Okay. All right, let's do the uh, let's do the Lick Mill Creek v. Chicago case, and then we'll move on to uh, uh, what I consider all of you. Um, never mind. <laughs> or what you consider me, I suppose, for, for three hours a week. Uh, okay, Ben, I mentioned this maybe about three weeks ago. If there is hazardous waste on your land, who are the two parties who might be liable? So the person who, put it there. right, the dump, who dumped it, or, or the person who currently yeah, not any intervening buyers. Good. So let's do let's do this Lick, Lick Mill Creek case. Um, so there's land in Santa Clara, California. Um, poor Mr. Uh, Kimball bought a number of lots. Uh, he had the site surveyed. Um, during the survey, they found some pipes, but they didn't really, you know, figure out what was going on. Um, after everything was done, they found, you know, some hazardous material. Um, now, the plaintiff, did the plaintiff sue the person who dumped it? Um, no. What's the title of the case? Uh, they're suing uh, the Department of Insurance. Good. And listen, why do you think they sued the insurance company, not the not the person who dumped it? Yeah, deeper pockets, right. So they sued uh, for indemnification. They made a couple of arguments. One, they said that the title was not marketable. Two, they said that the um, there was, that the hazardous waste was an encumbrance of the title. All right, so Isin, how did the court handle the uh, issue of whether hazardous waste made the title marketable? Um, I don't know, um, Does decreasing property value render title unmarketable? Why not? Because, um, 
Right. When you take a title, there's no dollar amount attached to it. You can have something on the on the property of the valid. So you could have something in the land that drops a value down all the way. You can still live on it. You might not be able to resell it for as much, but there's nothing actually wrong with the land. You still have fee simple, right? So all the things with respect to marketability of title that the plaintiff pleaded simply related to the value of the property. True, having hazardous waste in your property makes it worth a lot less, but that doesn't give you any remedies. Now, let's see. Uh, Eduardo, what about, what about the other alternate grounds uh, that the hazardous waste represented an encumbrance in the title? What did the plaintiff argue? Um, the plaintiff <laughs> argued that the definition of marketable title encompasses the, the market value. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, some, uh, they argued that this view depends on whether uh, other courts have adopted the same view, but this court held that or this court didn't find any authority to, uh, to um, determine what the case here. Mm -hmm. Good. So, does having, does having the, um, Hazardous waste in the land constitute an encumbrance. No. No. Encumbrances are things like liens, you know, easements, restrictive covenants. <clears throat> There's nothing about the hazardous waste that makes it inalienable, that you can't transfer it. But that's not true. Uh, uh, Rachel, what I just said that having hazardous waste in your land does not restrict its alienability. That's an absolute lie. Why is that a lie? Yeah. Right, right, right. So even though no one's going to buy land with hazardous waste on it, because remember, whoever gets it, who's ever living there now, is now, now in charge of it. The person who dumped it, I guess, is out of the picture because he's, he's not in the story anymore. But whoever's on the land now is to cover it. This person's never selling this plot of land. And that might be why he went after the title insurance company, not the, um, not the original dumper. Now, we did a couple cases, and, and I don't want to pull too far back into your memories, but you remember the case where uh, there was a setback where the house had to be a certain number of feet from the uh, sidewalk and how, you know, the mere fact that something violated the, the, uh, the zoning ordinance didn't make the title marketable? Remember that about a month ago? We did another case from Connecticut. I'm actually doing the map on, like, you know, the eastern shore where there was some sort of uh, filled wetlands and that did not render the title marketable. And here we have a case where even though there's hazardous waste, the title is still marketable because it's not an encumbrance. These cases are kind of all over the map. And environmental cases, which I don't focus too much on because it's kind of ancillary, have a lot of different results. And we will get to this, I, the Boomer case, which I only told you to skim, uh, is somewhat on point. But courts have a very um, uh, a shaky record of dealing with environmental issues. And they try various approaches to deal with it. Because on the one hand, you can look at this two ways. This makes the onus to clean it up on the person living on it. But it also makes it almost impossible for the land to be transferred. So it has these kind of competing public policy aims. On the one hand, it forces someone to clean it up, but it makes it harder for that cost to be dissipated to anyone else. Maybe it shouldn't be dissipated. Maybe you should just stick it to whoever's living there now. All right. Any questions on title insurance when we move on to... Uh, uh, land use controls and easements, which is have a little bit more interesting. I'm sorry, uh, nuisances, which is more interesting. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So let's talk about land use controls. Uh, all right. And this is this was not clearly in the reading, so I'll explain a little bit more broadly. Who knows what an externality is? Good. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Did you talk about externalities? Yeah. Good, no, good. I mean, <laughs> well, what would you talk about? No, I'll build off that. Trees? <laughs> okay. So there's two kinds of externalities. Let's see how good your memories are. What are the two kinds? 
Negative n. Good. What's a positive externality? Externalities don't have to be bad. They can be good. What's, what's, a, what's a positive externality? Come on, say this last year. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, you know, say you have a neighbor that, you know, cooks and it makes this, you know, beautiful aroma of baking and you love the smell. That's a positive externality, right? Now, say the neighbor has an oil refinery or a, you know, 50,000 pound air conditioning unit and makes a lot of noise. What would that be? Negative externality. Have you ever heard of the phrase internalizing externality? Have you ever heard that phrase? So the poor neighbor in you know Houston living next to this like massive diesel you know generator air conditioning machine, the fact that the sound's coming to him, he's suffering, he's internalizing a negative externality. Or say your neighbor is baking this lovely aroma and you are just wafting it in. That's a you're internalizing a positive externality. Okay? Have you guys ever heard of the Coase theorem? Please say yes. Coase, C-O-A-S-E, Ronald Coase. He's a Nobel Prize winning economist. He's at the University of Chicago. He's 101 years old. He's still alive. And actually, he just published a book like six months ago on like China economics. The guy is insane. He's like, it's unbelievable. If you see him, he's this frail little man in a wheelchair. But <clears throat> man, he's just, he totally revolutionized economics, law and economics. He wrote this pro article called The Problems of Social Cost, like 1962. It is the most cited law review article ever, ever, like ever. I mean, I wrote an entire article just on, on it. I mean, just there's so much on this article. The Coase theorem has to do with something called transaction costs. What's a transaction cost? Come on. So like, you buy property and the Right. Right. But even more so, a transaction cost is just what it costs to do it, to do a bargain. The Coase theorem has to do with something called Coasean bargaining, which is just a, a fancy way of turning a, a noun into an adjective. So Coasean bargaining. And let's, let's go to this example here. These are actually slides from a, a colleague, professor of mine at um, uh, George Mason, uh, Frank Buckley. So this is Ronald Coase. This picture is about 30 years old. He's, he looks much older than this now. Uh, and yeah, the problem with social costs is a very famous article. So could everyone see this, this diagram? Anyone ever hear of the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami? Not, not the new one, the original one in the 60s. That's like the posh one where is. This is like a much, much older one. So this is a very good illustration of the Coast theorem. So you had this two hotels right on the beach, right on the beach in Miami. We said they knocked the water off. So you have the Eden Rock Hotel and you have the Fountain Blue Hotel. The two hotels here. The sun's here. The people at the Eden Rock like having sun. They can sit by the pool and chill and GTL. And that's how they relax. <laughs> but what actually ended up happening was the Fountain Blue expanded. They built an addition. And they blocked all the suns, like Mr. Burns or something. And, you know, this was a very bad thing. So uh, the uh, 4525, that's the name of the Eden Rock Hotels Corporation, they moved to enjoin the construction of the hotel. Now, don't worry about what the court actually did. It's not too important. But let's just think this through. You're one hotel in Miami next to another hotel in Miami. Under the common law, you actually had a right of access to sun and air. It was actually a nuisance if you're blocking someone's access to sun and air. How could this case have been resolved? What are the couple ways this case could have been resolved? Hands up. It's not, not in the book. How, how could these parties perhaps have resolved this issue? Right. Right. So think about it this way. Say as a result of building this hotel that Eden Rock will result in a $100,000 loss in business, that people will not come. That means that this new addition is worth $100,000 to Eden Rock. But say by building this uh, extension to the Fountain Blue, Fountain Blue will gain $100,000 in new hotel guests. If that's the case, and assuming there are no transaction costs, meaning they can just bargain like this, what would be the optimal solution? Yeah. You're effectively paying to pollute on someone's land, in so many words. You are giving them the value of what it would take for them to make up their loss. They're losing 100, you're gaining 100, 
you build that extension and then you're even. You're both better off than you were before. Now what happens if they stand to gain $200,000 but they only lose $100,000? Then what do you do? Yeah, you only pay $100,000. And now both parties are better off. Had 45 whatever prevailed in court and they would have stopped the construction of this building, everyone would have been worse off. They'd be $100,000 poorer and they'd be $200,000 poorer. By engaging in this kind of cosy and bargaining, you can actually make everyone better off. Because now they're plus 100 and they're also plus 100. Everyone's better off. What actually happened in this case was not, not very cozy. Uh, Eden Rock actually enjoyed the construction of this hotel. And that was a net loss for everybody. Now, the Coast theorem says, without transaction cost, meaning assuming they could actually you know, negotiate the price of this and that, and you can add it all up, when, without transaction costs, property rights will be naturally allocated in the most efficient manner. That if these two people were able to negotiate, they would figure out a way to pay off one to the other that very frequently having a judge shut down the construction of a building is a very bad thing. There's a lot of what we call deadweight losses. That's kind of the economic term. You don't want stuff to be stopped when you can resolve it otherwise. Now, it's not always easy enough to say, you know, compensating for the building of this, you know, construction blocking the view. What if instead, you know, there's a massive 100,000-pound diesel air conditioner next to your bedroom? Or, you know, there's the encroaching manure of the dude ranch. <laughs> or some sort of uh, oil plant that's shaking and vibrating and whatever the heck it's doing. So the Coast Air is not, a, it's not perfect by any means, but it, is, it revolutionized how we think about property rights. Very often we think of negative externalities, you know. Uh, the, uh, the sunlight is being blocked, but it's reciprocal because we also have to think of how the other hotel can benefit the fountain blue. Costs are reciprocal in nature. You have to think of how does A affect B, but also B affect A. If we tell the dude ranch that you have to shut down so you don't bother these, these, uh, these seniors with your, with your poop, we also have to think, wait a minute, these seniors are going to be shutting down a ranch that's a profitable business that was perfectly lawful. It's this reciprocal nature of rights, how A affects B and how B affects A. We can't just think of which party is polluting. If we shut down an oil refinery, there are going to be a lot of jobs that are lost. People are going to lose their jobs. That's a very big thing. And if you can't locate the oil refinery in this city, it might go elsewhere, and you lose that income. So just think when you see this guy, good old Ronald Coase, uh, costs are reciprocal, A to B and B to A. Okay? God, I feel like I'm at George Mason. We did a Constitution the Coast Theorem in one day. It's like a, this is a very, very, very auspicious start to the new year. Uh, yeah, anyway, so here are pictures of the hotel. Uh, you know, here's the, the sunny fountain blue on uh, Collins Avenue, if you guys know where that is in South Beach. And here's the shady Eden Rock. You can actually see the, um, if you look close, you can actually see the shade coming over on the side. It's kind of funny. Um, yeah, it's actually shady in the literal sense. So that's the Coast Theorem in a nutshell. <laughs> anyway, so that's the Coast Theorem in a nutshell. You don't need to know that, you know, exactly for the exam, but if you can give me like a law and economics type answer an exam that tells me you're thinking good and you're thinking outside of, you know, what's actually like black letter law, and that would be a good answer. All right. So let's let's talk about uh I've got time. Let's talk about nuisances. Nuisances are kind of this like weird chimera, it's a hybrid, it's part tort, part property. Um, there's a lot of overlap in this class. We had a lot of breach of contract and negligence issues. So don't get too hung up on the tort stuff and the duties of care and breach of standard, what reasonableness is. I don't, I don't want you to focus too much on that. Um, focus more on how it relates to the property. So the entire notion of nuisances relates back to this Latin maxim, and I'm going to butcher it. Sic uteri tuo ut alienum nom litus. Uh, let's see, uh, Blair, what, what does that mean roughly? Don't give me a direct translation. Uh, what does that mean? Does that make any sense? You know, so going back to the fountain blue, 
Um, if you ask the fountain blue, they were using the property in a way that didn't bother anyone else. Well, if you ask even a rocket bother them, but in, the, in their mind, they weren't doing anything bad. And that's the subjective nature of this maxim. People don't often know what their actions will do until it bothers someone else. So you might think you're using your land consistent with not bothering anyone else, and then say, hey, wait a minute, there's a senior citizen community across the street, and they don't like my manure. You know, uh, it smells. So this maxim is wonderful as kind of a theoretical matter, but kind of where the rubber meets the road, it's not too, too useful. Because any time you use your property in any sense, you're affecting someone else. Whenever you build something, you might be obstructing someone's view or their sunlight. Whenever you're you know, raising cattle on your farm, you might be producing smell. Um, human beings are very bad at doing stuff that bothering anyone else. If you're at a roommate or something, you probably know about this. It's hard to exist without bothering someone else. Um, so it's not exactly clear that this, that this maxim works. But in common law, this was kind of how things work. Uh, anyone know what abate and nuisance means? Stop. That just means injunction. Uh, if you're getting someone to abate a nuisance, that means you're seeking injunctive relief. The court's saying, stop it. Don't do this anymore. All right. So, uh, okay, Car Carlton, let's do, um, I'll call you in a second for the North Carolina case, the, uh, the Morgan case, okay? So this case was from 1953. Okay, so a plaintiff purchased some land. Uh, he built some stuff on it. He built a house, restaurant, you know, trailer park uh, with 32 trailers. Um, the oil company had an oil refinery 1,000 feet from the house. Did that uh, oil refinery create any externalities? Yeah, and those are pretty obnoxious, obnoxious orders, right? And the uh, I think they said it rendered people sick and impaired for a couple hours a day. So before we get to the facts, this is a trailer park. Do you think this is a very, you know, posh area? It was probably maybe called industrial area. Where do you think oil refineries should be located? Oh, give me both. Right. So this this land was probably zoned some sort of commercial or industrial or urban. We're not Houston, so no zoning. But it was probably zoned in some manner. So it probably wasn't too um, unexpected that there would be an oil refinery or a bunch of trailer parks. Usually that's just a huge lot and people plug their, their trailers in. So the jury trial... Um, found that the refinery was a nuisance, and they set damage at $2,500, and they enjoined the defendant from continuing the nuisance. Um, Andrew, what does that mean to enjoin them from continuing the nuisance? Shut down the plant. It's like Bain Capital or something. I mean, it's, <laughs> but I, I said that intentionally because you might think, yay, you know, they shut down the polluting oil plant. They just shut down a company with employees and people who work there. And that produce oil, which people need for gas. Think of the reciprocal relationship. You're shutting down a polluting, noxious refinery. At the same point, you're probably tanking the entire local economy. No pun intended. So, um, Andrew, let's, let's try and think Kosian for a minute. What could the court have done instead of shutting it down? Okay. What else could they have done to maybe make the situation not quite as bad? Please? Good. Good. What else? There are these things that make smells not quite as bad. What are they called? <laughs> Scrubbers. Filters. Perhaps, you know... You know, the damages were set at $2,500, right? 
let's say this this factory this this plant operated at a cost of profits of hundred thousand dollars a year. Say filters could have been sold to alleviate the profit of twenty thousand dollars. What would have been better for society? Shutting down the plant or having them install filters? The injunction's a very, very, very harsh remedy, and it's very uncosian. Um, you can make the plaintiffs whole and pay them and install filters, and everyone will be better off with more money without having to shut the plant down. Now, the, the, the thing about compensating them for their health costs is actually tricky because this is probably some sort of latent defect. You know, it's a bar from last week. If you're inhaling these fumes, you're probably not going to know about it for 20 years, and it'll be like Aaron Brockovich or something, and you'll be really sick, and you're not going to know why. Um, so the health is tr trickier. Compensating them for future medical costs is just very difficult. But how they may also install filters or scrubbers or something that could have actually worked with that. All right, but that's not what happened. This is a, uh, this is a North Carolina court, and I think the book said the uh, justice who wrote this went on to be in the U.S. Senate and helped bring down Richard Nixon, so he's a real go-getter. Um, let's see, who was I up to? Uh, Kendall, what did, the, what did the Supreme Court do? Right, well, did they hold that it was a nuisance? Okay. Did they say why it was a nuisance? You didn't answer my question, but it was very good. Did they ever actually just say why it was a nuisance, other than saying it was intentional? Do any of these opinions ever say what it means to be a nuisance? No. Anyone? No, it was a trick question, but you got it right. Yes, it was, it was intentional. They knew the actions. They knew that their actions would result in these fumes and these obnoxious odors, whatever. Um, and because it's intentional, they don't need to show any kind of duty of care or anything. Don't, don't get hung up on that. What you should get hung up on is, what the heck is a nuisance? Why is, you know, this pollution a nuisance? Let's consider a couple alternatives. Say that the same factory was in the middle of, you know, a field where there was nothing surrounding it for, you know, 15 miles. Do you think a court would find that to be a nuisance? No. Say the same factory was, you know, uh, you know, right here on San Jacinto Street. You know, would that be a nuisance? It's a very subjective judgment. It's, it's very much attuned to the facts of the case and what's going on here. Um, and the court does a very almost dramatic job of reciting why this is bad, but they never actually define what the nuisance is. Um, for your purposes, don't worry about that. Just know that, you know, pollution, uh, odors, noise, vibrations, um, blocking of sunlight, uh, blocking of air, um, Blocking of support, that's like if there's some structure holding something else up, you can't break it. Um, things like that at common law were there. And if you think about it, these, all these laws governing nuisances at common law were just a way to, were, were really early attempts at environmental regulations. You know, if someone was polluting on your land at a smokestack and they were making soot, there was no Clean Air Act, you know, at common law. That didn't exist. So they had this thing called a nuisance thing. Hey, you're polluting. You're putting schmutz on our land, and we have to clean it up. Though this is a very not efficient means of regulating environmental stuff because it's very hodgepodge. Um, say that there was one factory that was polluting land owned by 100 people. You'd either have to bring some sort of class action or 100 separate lawsuits to, re to find a remedy. And how do you assess how, how much each person should be liable? You know, I'm sorry, how, much, how do you assess how much damage each person should get? It's very, very hard to calculate. So this was kind of an early effort to find out how this, how this can be kind of managed when people are, you know, to go back to Blair's question, when someone's using the property to bother someone else's property. Um, nuisance only applies to real property. It doesn't apply to personal property. So if I, you know, I break your bicycle, you can't, you know, follow a nuisance action against me. I feel like now they're destruction of property or something. One other related economics concept is least cost avoider. You probably did some torts. Anyone remember what least cost avoider is? Okay, let, let's, let's fast forward to the case in a few minutes, right? Say they have a very large air conditioner, right? And it costs $100,000 to make the air conditioner quieter. Or the plants can wear a pair of earplugs for like 59 cents. Who's the least cost avoider here? Earplugs. 
Now, that might not be fair. It might be unreasonable to ask you know, people to live with earplugs. But if you're talking about a $100,000 air conditioner or you know, a pair of earplugs that cost a couple pennies, the least cost of water is earplugs. Say here, with the oil case, <coughs> the least cost avoider could have simply been the oil company by installing some filters. Because say the price of shutting down the factory was $100,000 and the filters were 20000 If they install the filters and they get rid of these noxious smells, everyone's better off. The oil company can pollute as much as they want with the filters so they don't have the bad smells, and the plaintiffs won't notice it, and they can maybe be compensated for their having to deal with these, these things. Okay. There are alternate views uh, of how you view nuisance as kind of like a corrective justice, which takes not quite a reciprocal nature, but kind of takes a big guy versus little guy nature, saying, hey, you know, you have these big oil companies, and they're polluting everywhere. We can't let them do this. We have to be more fair. We have to um, ensure that people with unequal bargaining power who aren't at arm's length are not being taken advantage of. So the kind of the corrective justice approach would be something to the contrary, where it's saying we don't have to let them install filters, we don't have to give them this chance. If they're being the polluters, they should deal with themselves. And if they're, if they're ruining someone's land, shut them down. <coughs> Simply asking them to put in earplugs and we close their windows or like, you know, hold their nose, that wouldn't do it. All right, any questions in that case? We can move on. All right, let's move on. So the lateral and subjacent support, don't worry too much about that. That is just, um, if you think of your piece of land as kind of holding up some other piece of land, maybe there's like some sort of subsurface rights, you can't hollow out everything underneath their land so that their land collapses. Um, you know, if someone, you know, someone lives on a plot of land and you own the subsurface rights, like you can't just dig everything out like Bugs Bunny, everything underneath the entire thing falls, you can't do that. Um, but no, this doesn't apply to houses. So you have to maintain the land by itself, but if, say, if you have a house on top of it, and as a result of digging underneath, the house collapses, that doesn't matter. It's only for the land itself. All right, let's do, ah, finally. Who here is from Houston? You're all full of it. Every last one of you. Oh, it doesn't matter. Who are we up to? Uh, uh, Camilla. Are you from Houston? Okay. Will, are you from Houston? You from Texas? Yeah. Okay, good enough. <laughs> so we actually have a case from Houston. Good. Finally, the um, Estancias case. Estancias Dallas uh, v. Schultz. All right. Well, I'll call you. In a, I'll call on you in a second. So this is the case where um, someone builds a huge apartment house somewhere in Houston. I didn't actually look up where it is, but uh, somewhere probably in the loop. I'm guessing. 155 units, eight air condition, uh, eight of eight buildings. They build this massive air conditioner. Um, no one in this room was alive before air conditioner was that were they? Lots of evening students. Anyone actually remember Texas before air conditioner? That'd be bad. So this was 1973, so about 40 something years ago. Um, they built this massive air conditioning unit. It sounded like a jet airplane. It was loud. Um, poor Mr. and Mrs. Schultz. They lived within, I think, almost 100 feet of this huge generator. And they could hear it basically the entire summer. Okay. The trial court said that the, new, that the noise from this air conditioner was a nuisance. And they granted damages. Um, and they granted an injunction in favor of the Schultzes. So, Will, what does it mean that the injunction was granted? So what were their options? No, no, no. If, if you have an apartment building and it's required by law to have this air conditioner. Right, so it's a really, it's a really sticky situation, no pun intended. So they have a couple options. One, they can just shut down the entire building, which they have probably breach of action, a breach of uh, uh, leases against every single resident. Two, they could repair the air conditioner. But I think the air conditioner repair would be like almost $150,000, and they'd have to do it pretty much right away. 
So they really, they really don't have many, many options. Will, what did the, um, what did the defendant argue on appeal? What, what was his point? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is a case that has really kind of this cozy and bargaining type of deal. On the one hand, you have this huge apartment complex that has 150 units, let's say two people per unit. We're talking 300 people living there, just minimum, probably more. And then we have Mr. and Mrs. Schultz who are getting a lot of noise. So on the one hand, we have the harm to the Schultz from this air conditioner. On the other hand, we have the harm to the 150 residents if they shut down the AC and they're going to be hot the entire summer we have to move out because you can't have an apartment building without air conditioner. Okay. So in the Cosine world, let's see, uh, Matthew spoke a lot today. See, David, in the, in the Cosine world, if they were allowed to kind of bargain, with the, would a court have ordered them to shut down the air conditioner? How, what, what, what kind of resolution could they have achieved? If you had a really noisy, I, I think the book said that the value of the house was twenty-five thousand dollars. What if they offered them fifty thousand dollars for the house and just have them move? Yeah, double the value of their house, buy the property, live somewhere quieter. If the cost of replacing the the, the engine, the thing was a hundred thousand dollars, and the house the value of the house was only about twenty-five at the max, maybe now it's twelve. It would seem a much more um, economically efficient resolution is you buy them out. Anybody not like that? Blair? There's also the idea that all real property is weak, so mm -hmm. giving them new real property would not necessarily be like true legal value. Why, why should we be kicking little Mr. and Mrs. Schultz out of the house when this big bad corporation came here with their air conditioner and they had to mess it up? You know, why are we kicking the dude ranch off their land when they were here first and they were operating probably lawfully? Or we kick the dude ranch off their land because there's you know thousands of people, senior citizens living here, and there's only one dude ranch, and we have two Mr. and Mrs. Schultzes, and we have 150 apartments. So how we define the public interest can vary significantly. You could argue what? Mm -hmm. I can't hear you. Average? Reciprocity advantage. Good. Depending how you define the public interest, I don't know. Depending, depending how you define the public interest, you can view these cases significantly differently. If we view it through the lens of Mr. and Mrs. Schultz, it's like, oh, how are we going to kick these people off their land? Let them get all the money they want. Let them shut down this noise air conditioner. If you view it from the 150 people who live in these buildings, there's a lot of people. It's a lot of families. Say it's a family of four. That's 600 people. I think the book says something like there's no shortage of housing in Houston. They won't find that kind of stupid. Like, or, or, or it didn't really make much sense. Because that's saying, well, the 150 people who live there can move somewhere else. Right? Well, couldn't Mr. and Ms. Schultz move somewhere else and solve this entire problem? Is that just the book running into your argument in a way that I wouldn't be so cynical as that, but depending how you define the public interest, if you're saying that you know there's lots of housing stock in Houston, these 150 apartments can they can go live somewhere else. I mean, think about it this way: if you force the company to pay 150 thousand dollars on this new air conditioner, what do you think will happen to rent? Rent goes up. Think a lot of people might move out? Maybe. You can't really increase rent in the middle of a lease. They're probably going to take a serious hit. Maybe the company goes out of business. Yes? That's true. 
So this exercise is good. Um, if you ever do injunctions in an equity class, how you frame the public interest is big. In the Deuterant case, we'll talk about that in a minute, the court framed the public interest in terms of the people in the city. Why wouldn't the public interest include the people working on a ranch? Why wouldn't the public interest include the people working at the oil refinery? It cuts both ways. So ultimately, the court said that. Um, uh, so actually, Nicholas, what did the um, what did the court hold here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let's do a little Houston. Houston has no zoning, right? Let's see. Uh, Rebecca, Houston has no zoning, right? You think in a normal area, if you're going to build a 15-story high-rise, the area will be zoned for residential houses or apartment houses? Houston's unique that you can actually have a residential house right next door to a apartment complex. Do you think something like this could be resolved if maybe you could not build a, what was that? Like, like a Disney? Oh. Yeah, actually someone in my the evening class uh, talked about that. We talked about that last week when we did the titles. Right. So generally, if you want to build a apartment complex, you build an area zone for apartments in which there are not going to be houses 50 feet from this massive, you know, diesel generator that sounds like an engine. Something to think about. I think there was actually uh, a thing in the notes about zoning. I think they forgot that Houston has none. Or they didn't mention it, so now you guys are smarter. Yeah. And I guess the cheapest remedy would have just been a pair of 15-cent earplugs, but we're not going to be so uncivil as that. Why should people have to live with earplugs? You don't like earplugs? No. no? What about earplugs on $100,000? Oh, people in the apartment house? No, in the house. What what if it was wear earplugs and I'll give you fifty thousand dollars? Fifty thousand. <laughs> say say that the cost of repairing DC was a hundred. We'll give you a pair of earplugs and fifty. We'll give you a lifetime supply of earplugs, fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> Only during the summer, which in Houston is like eight months of the year. <laughs> Would anyone take that? What year is it? Nineteen seventy-three. <laughs> You can just sell your house and walk away. <laughs> All right. Let's do. Let's skip the Boomer case. We'll do the. Um, we'll finish up with the uh, the Dude Ranch case. I think that was, that's more Texas than, than cement. All right. So. All right, uh, Caitlin. I'll call you in a second. So the facts of this case. Anyone ever been to a Dude Ranch or like worked on a Dude Ranch? My parents are visiting in like a couple weeks and like, we want to visit a dude ranch. I was like, I don't know. Are there any around here? Do they exist? They're from New York. They don't, they don't know what, they think I'm living like in Beverly Hillbillies. They have no idea what I'm living. They, they don't understand like, she sounds like, like fourth largest population. That just doesn't, that doesn't register with them. All right. So you have this place in Maricopa County. It's outside of Phoenix. Um, they, this company is you know, building a feedlot, and they have a lot of cows making a lot of poop. Um, and it's fine, though, because they're there, and really it's not bothering anyone. But then you have this developer who's kind of encroaching, and the developer starts building a little bit more and building it closer and building it closer. And this is what the book calls coming to the nuisance. Let's see. Caitlin, what does that mean, coming to the nuisance? Yeah, I, yeah, no, that's right. It's effectively the, the 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 crap was there, and they were building closer to it. Does anyone like? Does anyone feel bad for the ranchers? In this case, who here feels bad for the ranchers that they have to shut down their business? Anyone feel bad for the seniors living in like their little sun community? Yeah. But didn't they like go check that property and do a smell test or something? <laughs> no. Probably what happened was they, they went to a subdivision. They said, oh, I like this model home, which was three miles away from the, uh, uh, the, the, the crap. So what did, let's see, uh, the, Lauren, what did the, um, 
What did the court hold in this case? Who, how, did, how did the court kind of split the baby, so to speak? Oh, I didn't mean that one. That's even worse. <laughs> how, how, how did the court resolve this one? We'll go into the baby in a second. Good. So this is a very Kosian outcome, isn't it? So on the one hand, is this dude ranch a nuisance? Yes. Why? Because it's creating a lot of poop. It's like a thousand million pounds of manure a year, some absurd amount. I can't even conceive of that. <laughs> well, it's just, it's a lot. Um, so this dude ranch is, or, or this, this feeding lot, whatever it is, is producing a lot of manure. And manure attracts flies, and flies carry airborne diseases. We have West Nile now in Dallas, which I saw. I and Rosie had that down here. We had it in New York like a decade ago. So on the one hand, you have this nuisance that's polluting. And it's annoying all these old seniors who are retiring. So that's A to B. But B to A. If the seniors win, the dude ranch is out of business. And they're shut down. So how did... Um, Tori, how did the court resolve this uh, resolve this pickle? Good. Not just some. <coughs> yeah. Right, but what are they calculating? Let's see, um, Jonathan. What, how much? How much is uh, how much is the uh, developer on the hook for here? Buying them out. So what actually happens here? Say uh, another bargainer, you know, at arm's length, wants to buy this dude ranch for say a million dollars. That's how much it would take to sell the business. That's how much they have to pay. This is like going back to the Eden Rock. Say, you know, say instead of just blocking the sun, they block, you know, all the warmth and everything in this house. You know, this hotel is very cold. Found Blue, if I had to actually pay the, the entire price of what it would take to shut down that business, how much they'd sell for lost profits, lost earnings, I guess minus real property and minus other pictures and stuff. But they'd have to pay the entire amount to shut down the business. So now... The developer says, okay, we're going to move this dude ranch away. You have to pay all the costs of shutting the business down. I don't think you can move a dude ranch, can you? A feedlot? Can you move that? Like herding cattle along the plane? I don't know how that would work. I mean, I should have looked up. What do you think happens to all the cows? I don't have a cow. So, yeah, lots of burgers, a big barbecue. <laughs> the, se the seniors grilled them all. <laughs> so, I don't know. But, yeah, so what the court remanded is saying, hey, if you seniors want to have a nice, smell-free existence, you have to pay for it. This is a much more equitable situation than the case with the, uh, the oil refinery or the diesel generator. Because it not only considered the A to B, but considered the B to A. It recognized that when we shut down a lawful business that wasn't doing anything wrong, there are people who lose their jobs, people who lose their beef, people who lose their fertilizer. That's a big deal. We have to compensate the owner of the dude ranch for this. And, and, and I think a large part of it was that it was very foreseeable for the developer to know that they were going to have this problem because they're moving closer and closer to, closer to the crap. So they should have known, and so they're kind of on the hook more for that as well. All right. Any questions on this one? All right. Yes? I know. I think I'm uh, from the area of Missouri. There's a landfill there now. Oh, really? Yeah, I think there's a quarry there. Oh, thank you for sharing that. So they probably did get rid of the cows. All right. Any other questions? Happy Constitution Day. Enjoy.